Hi, thank you for coming. Welcome to Brown Bag Lit. We're very happy to see you here. I'm Chloe Elena Miller, and I co-founded Brown Bag Lit with Shasta Grant. First, I'd like to welcome one of our two interns who will introduce herself to you, Demetra. Yes, hi, I'm Demetra Matutis. I'm the PR intern at Brown Bag Lit, um, where I mostly work on publicity and graphics. I'm a PR major with a minor in creative writing at American University, and I'm really excited to be here tonight. Thank you. Now we'd like to take a moment to introduce Brown Bag Lit to you. And we have a quick slideshow to use to help introduce ourselves to you if you're not familiar with us yet. Um, so Shasta will share her screen. Okay. Um, so it all started with a phone call when I called Shasta in December, 2022. And I said, I've got an idea. And she said, I'm in. But it really started years ago when a poet and a fiction writer met at Sarah Lawrence College's MFA program in 2003. We shared work, took the train into New York City to attend readings, and maintain a friendship through decades and continents. We presented at conferences together, shared a hotel room at the Not Fake AWP conference, and even put together a DIY writing residency one summer so we could spend time writing together. And it's in this spirit of community that we first conceived a brown bag lit, where everyone, like you, is welcome. We host most of our events at lunchtime, East Coast time, because as busy working parents, we find that this schedule works best for us and we hope that it works well for you as well. We've offered classes, a virtual summer residency, accountability group, almost 20 free events at this point, and now this is our second annual fake AWP conference. Our upcoming offerings include a class on writing turns in poetry and prose, our lunch break writing accountability group, and our last fake AWP panel, as well as monthly programs. You can register for everything through our website, brownbaglit.com. And for this year's fake AWP series, we're really happy to be partnering with the Portland, Oregon-based bookstore, Annie Bloom's Books. Annie Bloom's has been a proud indie since 1978. They can ship books anywhere in the, in the United States from their store. You can follow the link in the chat to order books to support these fabulous writers and the bookstore. On to today's show. Please join me in welcoming authors TJ Butler, Tara Campbell, and Rebecca Morrison. Please do make sure that you stay muted during the discussion, keep the chat open to ask questions, follow along with the links, and share anything about anything you like about what you hear. I'll be posting the bios in the chat, the link to the bookstore, and more. So now I'd like to turn it over to them. Welcome. Thank you. Hi. All right. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Tara Campbell. Um, I'll be uh, talking to you tonight along with my illustrious uh, co-panelists, TJ and Rebecca. Um, and you can see our um, information in the chat. We will also briefly uh, introduce what types of things we write about. Um, but first, of course, I, I want to thank Shasta and Chloe um, for starting this whole uh, this whole uh, event, and of course, Demetra for stewarding us through tonight's uh, tonight's talk. And um, when uh, when the three of us got together, uh, myself, TJ, and Rebecca, to talk about what we wanted to talk about, how we wanted to structure this. One thing that was uh, that we felt was important to point out with and to start with was that writing difficult things is not necessarily synonymous with excavating personal trauma. Um, so tonight's discussion is not going to be based necessarily in specific traumas, um, barring what things you folks would like to talk about. Um, and we will have an opportunity for, um, for Q and A. Um, but we all face different challenges and we wanna acknowledge that we all find different things difficult to think about or write about. So our goal today is not so much gonna be focusing on specific trauma as it is to talk about how we can manage the process of working through and writing about things that we find difficult to face. So um, we're gonna have an initial discussion between the three of us and it'll cover three main questions being what we write about and why uh, two being methods and tips we can offer uh, for writing about difficult things, and three lessons learned. 
And throughout our discussion, um, please do utilize the chat to ask questions of your own, because we are aiming to spend uh, the last 20 minutes or so of the session answering your questions. So you all have a hand in directing what we talk about tonight. Um, so before I begin, um, TJ and Rebecca, is there anything I have forgotten to mention to kick us off? That sounds like that sounds great. Covered everything. Yeah. Okay. All right. Great. So let's go ahead and get into it. Our first question is going to serve kind of as our introduction as well. So I'd like to ask each of our panelists, and then I'll follow with my own answer. What genres you write in and what kind of difficult topics do you write about? And does your writing naturally tend that way to those topics, or do you have to force yourself to confront the tough stuff? And if so, why do you force yourself? To confront those tough topics. So um, whomever, whoever would like to jump in, please do so. Okay. So, I, oh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Rebecca, you have two exciting books coming out, so you can start. That's crazy. Bring up the stuff from the uh, the laundry basket in the basement. Oh, uh, thank you. So um, I'm Rebecca Morrison, and um, I started writing in earnest only a couple of years ago. And I had a dream of writing for decades, but I never thought, and this fits very well into this session, I never thought I, uh, A, had the permission to, um, and B, I was afraid of the reactions of the people that I would have to, to write about. Um, and I jumped in, with having a conversation with the main person that I would talk about, which was my mother. My mother and I had a turbulent um, time and we are um, very close now, but I always wanted to share my story because I felt alone when I was growing up and when I was a young woman. Um, I have the story of belonging and identity and worth and all the difficult things that come with that in terms of being an immigrant and being outside of the size of what society and my culture considers an ideal woman. I was told uh, a lot that that's, uh, that I had to change, that in order to find success as a human being, as a woman, I would have to be something different. And I fought against that my whole life. And I had difficult times where I didn't think that I could be worthwhile or as good as other people because of that. And I, I really, in, I knew that I wanted to write about that for decades. And then the pandemic hit and I, like a lot of people started to look at my life and say, well, if not now, when? And how I did it is I jumped in and started taking classes on creative nonfiction and everything I wanted to write. So for me, it was a natural uh, subject. Everything I wanted to write was about difficult topics because I find those most interesting and I want other people to know that they're not alone. And my essays, um, that's, the close to 20 essays I wrote in the last two, three years um, that I published in uh, big publications, national publications, some of those, the reactions were what I, uh, which was amazing, were thousands and thousands of women telling me, I feel seen, this is what I went through. And so um, that's, that's what I'm writing about, eating disorder, body image, identity, belonging. Um, and I'm taking those essays and my experience and uh, finishing a middle grade novel for teenage girls, um, a story that is based on my childhood. Thank you so much, Rebecca. So my name is TJ Butler. And I just tell people that I write things that are not all fun and games. So um, to ask, you know, why do you write? I didn't know why I was writing previously. I was telling stories about my childhood and about my family. I grew up in foster care and my mother put me in foster care because it was either um, move away from her boyfriend and save me 
or get rid of me and she could stay with her boyfriend. So I was packed off to foster care. And um, so I had a lot of stories about what happened at home, my complicated relationships with my mother, with other people, with myself. And so when I started taking writing seriously in my mid 40s, I thought I have a lot of stories to tell. And I started writing them. It was really about storytelling. Um, people are interested in these things. And I just had so much, so much to say. So I recently had a book come out. And when you have a book come out, you have to talk about it a lot. And so I was, I had to give a lot of thought to, you know, what's the point of my book? What do I write about? My book is a collection of short stories. And I realized that I wrote all of my stories to control the trauma narrative. And that means I put characters of various disadvantaged backgrounds, whether that is spending time in prison, whether that is having a mother that's a sex worker, whether that is making really bad decisions, all of these kinds of women that society thinks that kind of woman, I put them in situations that similar to maybe I was in or similar to a situation I can imagine. But the difference between them and me is that I gave them a voice and agency during times when I had none. And being able to articulate this means that I have written my stories for you. Any of you that have seen some shit and lived to tell about it, I wrote my stories for you so that you can read about somebody who comes out of it. Um, the question of whether it's easy to write it or whether I have to force myself, this is kind of what I know. So I'm thinking now about writing a novel where the main character is not broken. And that's kind of a thing for me to conjure up that character. Um, so that I think sums it up for me in a nutshell. All right, thank you, TJ. And uh, for me, I write um, mostly prose, uh, flash fiction and speculative fiction, uh, as well as poetry. And I think my poetry is what more directly relates to this particular topic, um, because most of my poetry comes from a sense of rage. <laughs> and most of my rage comes from how often I'm, you know, reading the news. Yeah, I mean, that kind of determines the level of rage. Um, and in terms of the specific topics, um, it's two main isms, racism and sexism, and the violence that surrounds both of those isms. And I think that's because, you know, as a mixed race woman, those are my kind of axes of identity. Um, and I think I write, I find myself writing about difficult things because, well, in a different setting, uh, the editor of my book that's coming out has nothing to do with, you know, the book doesn't really focus on racism or sexism. Um, but my editor noticed throughout my work that I have a sense of fairness and that's kind of what drives a lot of my storytelling. And I didn't really write that like with, I didn't intend to focus on fairness. Um, but the more I think about it, that kind of permeates everything I write. Um, and in, you know, talking about uh, preparing for this panel, I think it's because I feel like I was raised with a sense of fairness. Um, and I feel like I was treated as an individual, not as a gender, not as a race, you know, and so I was able to grow up thinking the world was a fair place. Um, and the longer I lived and the more places I visited and the more people I saw interacting, um, I realized that this was a special place. And I also got pissed off when other people didn't experience that way of living and didn't have the benefits of living with a sense of fairness. And so I think that's what gets me outraged when I see the lack of fairness, the lack of equity in the world, it makes me wanna call it out. Um, and so this morning in terms of why we write, I saw this perfect uh, post on Instagram. So I wanna share it with you. Um, and I'll read it as I share it as well. The post reads, I was told yesterday to stop being so angry all the time. You know, I'd like to, 
but I have a functioning cerebral cortex, a vagina and uterus, and the capacity for empathy. So I don't see descending from a constant state of abject rage anytime soon. But thanks anyway, Pollyanna. And that I think encapsulates why I write about the difficult things because they're bullshit. We put each other through so much bullshit and we don't have to. And I think that's kind of like that feeling of we don't have to, why are we doing this? Um, that fuels a lot of my writing. So um, I love the, the, <laughs> the, the quote in the, uh, in the meeting chat, if you leave nothing else. All right, so let's move on to our second question, um, getting into methods. Um, so I'd like to ask, and let's see, I guess we could just keep going in the same order. So starting with Rebecca and then going to TJ and myself. Um, how do you write about difficult things? Do you go direct or indirect? Or do you go around or through? Um, and what advantages or disadvantages does each approach have? So uh, Rebecca, if you could kick us off there. Yeah, um, I had a, I, I was a, recently at a, a, a writer's talk and they were talking about courage to write about our grief and our anger and injustice. And for me, um, it doesn't, it didn't take courage to write it, but it took courage to share it. So, you know, they say, oh, just write for yourself. I am comfortable in my personal life sharing a lot. I'm a very open person. But as we'll talk about, when you write difficult things, especially if they are, um, it's nonfiction, creative nonfiction or nonfiction essay, memoir, um, there are other people involved in that, not just the characters in those stories. So for me, it was my mother and I at first, me and my uh, relationship with with other people. There's so many tangential people in that siblings, uh, friends of your friends of that person. For example, when I wrote a piece about my mother and I's relationship, even though the ending was um, quite a love story of coming together at the end, um, the middle was quite dark. And people from that have known my mother from everywhere called her and said, how could your daughter write such a thing? Are you okay? Now I had talked to my mother uh, and my siblings about the fact that I wanted to do these things. Um, and now looking back for the last two, three years, uh, I don't know how I, I pushed through when I did it because it is it is jarring for an entire family to have one person tell their story. Everybody sees stories differently in a family, in a couple, a parent-child relationship. Everybody sees that movie in a completely different way. And I, because of the writing group I was in, I questioned it all the time with my writing group that was writing a memoir. How can I do this? Do I have the right and we have a right to our own stories, but we won't be able to control the repercussions from that. And I decided that it was worth it for me to write those stories that helped me heal in a way. And, uh, and the connections that I felt with the readers uh, made it worthwhile. Um, so that's that's how I did it. I just jumped in. Thank you so much, Rebecca. So when I write, I like to go visit the place. So in my writing, I typically write about things that are within like a couple hours drive of where I live. So I can go there and immerse myself. And I grew up pretty close to where I am now. So... I have, when I write about something, I kind of use this immersive method where I might um, listen to music that I listened to during that time in my life, or I might look at old photos. Um, so I really like to just kind of grasp on to a piece of something. Um, so for you guys who are attending and you are, you know, for whatever reason that you're interested in writing difficult things, um, 
putting yourself back there works for me, but it might not work for somebody to drive by their childhood home if that's the scene of the crime, because it is not easy when you're done typing and you're finished with that draft. It's not easy if you have just plopped yourself back into that and relived it or relived you know, some kinds of things that you want to write about. Um, so I find that it often, um, it weighs heavy. One of the things that I've noticed, um, I've published a number of pieces in places like Huffington Post and Insider, and telling those stories is great to get them out there. And I receive, um, I don't read the comments very often, but people will email and they will email about you know, my story touched them and they'll share their own story. And I love knowing that my words touched people, but it is a heavy weight to bear to have released my own kind of heavy thing, traumatic thing into the world and to have somebody say, here is my trauma. Um, so that's always kind of heavy. Um, so as far as self-care, um, I don't think that we're going to talk about that specifically, but when I am writing the hard things, <coughs> excuse me, I want to make sure that I have something soft to land on. And whether that is, you know, going out for a cupcake or whether that is just having, you know, some comfortable blankets or something, um, it's really important if you immerse yourself in something that is personally difficult, you have to think about it and you have to dissect it and you have to get it down on the page in a way that a reader is going to say, hey, this is great. I understand it. I can relate. We need to take care of ourselves when we, you know, when we tell those stories. Um, another thing that's interesting is letting people read our work and critique it when we have just flayed ourselves and open ourselves up and put all of this stuff on the page it's so hard when a reader says oh that super traumatic thing that happened to you I'm a little confused by this can you explain this a little differently and that's what we do when we read and critique others work in writing groups and when people share their writing um and so that's the thing as we go forward and write about the things that have that we have found difficult trauma or just something that bothers you um we have to keep in mind that if we are writing for an audience and we let people read it we're gonna have to clarify things that have hurt <coughs> excuse me hurt us or pardon me bothered us <laughs> so Tara, i'll turn it over to you Okay. Yeah, I think I'm having a little of the same thing because I'm like, hey, hey. Um, so yeah, so direct or indirect around or through. I find myself, even when I'm writing directly about something that is really pissing me off, <clears throat> and that usually comes out as poetry, I think I mentioned. So it's that sense of immediacy, and it's usually about reproductive freedom. Um, and I'm usually just like blazing hot about it. Right. Um, so I even when I do that, I find myself being indirect in terms of kind of being ridiculous about it. Right. So I wrote a poem, Vessels of the State. I'm like, yeah, sure. Well, we won't resist. We're going to have your babies. We're going to have we're going to bear Bibles. We're going to give birth to pitchforks. We're going to give birth to whatever you want. You know, we'll just give birth multiple times. We'll grow as many vaginas as Kali has arms. You know, go ahead. We'll just go ahead and give birth to everything, whatever, you know. And so that's kind of how I go about it in an indirect way, just completely mocking it. Right. It seems this these restrictions seem ridiculous to me, so I'm going to be ridiculous back. And so that's my way of just going at it, but going around it so I can just deal with it. Because if I write it direct on the page, it can get really bogged down and it can get really bitter. And if I can't get it out of my body onto the page, it will be corrosive. Um, so that's how I kind of deal with all this stuff um, just like, it's like bile. It's like 
getting bile out of my body, whether or not it ever gets into a form that's publishable or anything like that is secondary to me. So for me, the writing about it is how I deal with it, how I get it out of myself so it doesn't corrupt me. Um, mm. And uh, yeah, sometimes it's, it's less, um, sometimes it's even more oblique. Um, if I'm writing prose, um, again, because of the sense of fairness, uh, I was writing a story called The Spleen that just started because I woke up with this phrase in my head, good afternoon, I am a spleen. Didn't sound like a phrase that was going to create any kind of serious story at all. And I started writing away and I'm like, oh, what does the spleen want? Where is the spleen? Oh, the spleen is looking, you know, to buy a condo. Anyway, it just like started this completely ridiculous thing. And it wasn't until the end that I realized I was writing a story about racism. I was writing a story about prejudice um, because I had to look up what a spleen looked like what a spleen did and it's like oh that looks like a, a a liver and I'm like well you know what what is the what is the I just started thinking about like how we write and talk about things that we don't know about in the first place and we do the same to people right we don't know about these people's lives we just kind of go on you know rumors we've heard and don't bother to educate ourselves so what I'm saying is by starting a story about something completely silly, um, my tendencies bubbled up through it and it became about fairness and it became about prejudice. So that's an example of both a direct and indirect way of going at these difficult things that I, that I write about. Um, and before I ask my third question, I do wanna remind people, you are welcome to use the chat to write questions of your own and I will keep an eye on that and make sure we get to folks. Um, but let's go ahead to our third question. And this is lessons. What are some things you've learned about uh, taking on these difficult topics you're taking on? It could be research, craft, self-care, any kinds of lessons you've learned. Um, Rebecca, we'll start with you again. Thank you. And I realized I just wanted to say a couple things about uh, writing that I didn't before. Uh, people ask me quite often after my essays, uh, you know, uh, writers, how did you go that far? How was, you know, how, how did you share the things that we are so scared to say? Um, I think a lot of people think their experiences are unique and they are suffering through something that other people won't understand. And if they share it, they will be seem weak or damaged. Um, and the way I write is putting it as going as far as I possibly can. I I hold nothing back in that specific topic that I want because I know in my gut that we are connected as women, as human beings. I write a lot about being a woman, so that's that's the way I put it on the page, whether it's being assaulted or a light subject, even although I don't really like it. But I don't write about very many light subjects, but um, uh, I try to go there because I know when people read it, um, I want them to see themselves in that secret struggle that they have. That, that means the most to me. Um, what have I learned? I've learned connected to this. I've learned that the more authentic I am, the more truly authentic I am with what I'm going through, the stronger the connection to other people that are reading it. And that means everything. That's what, that's why I write when uh, decades of reading other people's work, the magic that I felt when I read words that i I recognize myself in. That's what I think about when I write. And when I started writing those essays that um, circulated, some of them, two of them went viral so that there were a lot of people and uh, one of them, three, four million people. And so I got emails from every, it was about identity and American belonging. I got 
emails from every imaginable belonging that you that is out there, whether it's that person's identity or their spouses or their cousins or their sisters, or whether I write about mother, daughter, and people email me saying, I am the daughter you spoke about. I am the mother you spoke about. Um, what I learned was the power of, of storytelling, something that we all know, we watch movies, we read books, and we, we connect with them. But when you do it yourself, when you tell that story that's authentic to you, authentic to you in a place where you feel it in your body and it connects to um, others in such a visceral way. I guess I, I love it so much and um, I wanna do it for the rest of my life because of what I've seen it means to the readers. Thank you so much, Rebecca. So the biggest lesson that I take away from writing my truth is that my truth had other people in it. And um, my little sister and her sons will no longer speak to me. So um, I think Rebecca or Tara mentioned um, that siblings, everybody's life is different. And so there's the saying that no, no two siblings have the same parents. And I was, and we can all think about our sibling that was the good one, our sibling that was the funny one, or maybe we had somebody that was the bad one in the family. And everybody was parented differently growing up in the same house. And so I was putting out a lot of work about myself and telling my truth and um my little sister decided that I was lying and so because of telling my truth um not even about her but just about growing up in the family I lost a relationship with her and I lost a relationship with my nephews and um I miss her um and the nephews, they're growing up now, and I don't even remember how old they are. But um, the biggest thing I learned was um, my truth. Telling my truth, people aren't going to like it. And, you know, I have received emails and comments on my essays that I've published, and people don't like them there either for some of the things. But um, I would say to take away, if writers are writing difficult things um you can not write things about other people um Anne Lamott has a great quote and she says if people wanted you to write warmly about them they should have behaved better and I can recite that quote in my sleep because I live that but my biggest lesson like I said is just knowing that other people are going to take personally my words. And, you know, if we collectively as writers write our truth that involves other people, if they read it, they may take it personally as well. Um, and I've learned craft lessons along the way. Um, my craft is really just the more I write, as we do, the more we write, the better writers we become. Um, but I would primarily take away on the topic of difficult subjects that, you know, people will read it and have their own thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I think for me, because I'm coming from a slightly different perspective, because I'm not necessarily writing about my own experiences, um, yes, as a woman and as a mixed race person, I have had, you know, kind of, you know, unsavory things said to me, done to me, what have you, but that's not the main point of, uh, 
of departure when I'm writing about these difficult things, um, because I've been very blessed in my life that those are sort of few and far between. And I mean, so much so that it took me a while to realize the systemic nature of racism and sexism and that they weren't just the odd comment from the ill-informed person. Um, but uh, I think in, in my case then, uh, for me, research is uh, the main starting point. Um, and you know, I, if I'm outraged, I wanna know why, and I wanna know if I'm justified. And so headlines aren't enough to create a reaction that will lead to a solid piece whether I'm talking about poetry or prose. So I need to know exactly what I'm reacting to and then examine and see if I'm being reasonable. Perhaps there were extenuating circumstances be behind what seems a sensationalist story, or perhaps it is full on bullshit. But knowing, being that secure in my subject as though it had happened to me um, allows me to sort of write a solid piece. Um, and, uh, and then, my self-care is getting off the platforms altogether after I've like had my fill of that of that bile. Um, I would say a second lesson is to let the piece take the form it wants to take. Um, I sort of labored under this illusion at one point that if I'm going to write about a serious topic like racism and, you know, for me, it's writing about sort of the uncomfortable in-betweenness of being mixed race and not really fitting the images we, uh, you know, have been sort of fed about what it means to be Black, um, either in terms of culture or literature, right? I'm not in any of the sort of, you know, commonly perceived notions of Blackness because I'm in between. Um, and... So um, so I thought it, this has to be an essay because it's a serious topic and I need to explain everything. And so I was writing this essay and it was just like jumbled and not really going anywhere because I didn't have a point really um, at the time. And so as it turns out, what I was trying to cover in an essay, I felt I expressed better in poetry because the in-betweenness is just, I mean, poetry can uh, handle the inherent contradictions of being in between and being neither here nor there and not having to have a conclusion because there isn't one because I'm still alive, right? So I'm st still experiencing that. So um, for me, it was a lesson to um, just let the piece be what it's gonna be. And if it resonates, it's gonna find its audience. Um, so that's how I was able to, to deal with it. And um, I do see that we do have um, at least one question in the chat. Uh, the question is, how do you calculate or consider when you are ready to write about something difficult? Um, let's see, uh, the writer is talking about having a genetic disorder and a lot of health issues and saying it feels incredibly raw, what, what they've written so far, and uh, they've had a hard time working in it in a literary direction. So, um, so how do you feel, uh, you know, how do you decide when you're ready to write about something? You may be, as the, uh, as the questioner asked, like desperate to allow these thoughts, feelings, experiences to turn into material, um, but how do you know when you're ready to really do that? Um, so yeah, we'll start with uh, Rebecca yeah. and TJ. Yeah, I, I love this question um, because that was my whole life uh, until three years ago. How do I how do I do it? I thought I would never do it until I left this earth because it was a secret of 30 year secret of eating disorder. It was. Um, how can I talk about a mother that I love and I'm close with now that did things to me that uh, other people would think was horrible? How do I do this thing? Here's my advice for you. Take a class. It Take a class that you feel safe in. And in that environment, you can start to experiment with writing your story and having a smaller environment of students that are doing similar things. There's some great, great teachers that do creative nonfiction. And that when, when you're taking class, it's not just the teacher, it's, uh, it's kind of a self-selecting group. You'll find students, you'll find people that are also trying to do the same thing you are. So you can experiment, you get feedback from those people. And if it's a good class, I'm, I'm just going to recommend the class I took, Peter Mountford. He's fantastic. And 
Um, he wore, uh, and he guided us through that process. Um, also, as we've been talking about, you do have to weigh when you tell your story, who is it going to affect and what you're willing to, what you're willing to risk. The way I did it was I had a conversation with those people, mainly my mother. I'm going to write about this. Why? Because I want, I want to make a change in the world. And as Tara was talking, I realized, and this, this panel is helpful for me uh, too, is that I, I am angry. And a lot of it is because of this built up anger over my 52 years on this earth about the way women are treated and the way I've been treated. And that anger has bubbled up for so long that when I start to write these, it's for me, it's like, I wanna write it even as, as viscerally as I can, because I know there are women that don't see themselves in stories. And if I can just be one person that can do that, and it means everything to me. Um, writing this, I'm writing a, a book for teenage girls and I got wrapped up in how to sell it. And, you know, I have an agent, they're trying to see, where do I want this book? And, and my brother who said something great to me when I started, and you, you might not think it's great, but let me tell you, it's difficult for him to see articles that his friends read and he reads about his mother who is also my mother, and I'm saying things about her that are quite dark. And he said to me, I don't want to read your pieces, and it is difficult that you're doing this, but I support you 100% because I want you to have that purpose. I want you to be successful in what you want to do. I want you to have that the meaning in your life. And so how complicated is that? Um, Anyway, he said about this book, and this is how I feel about every essay. And if you're writing, if you're waiting to write this difficult thing, if one person finds that story and it changes their life, it's worth it. If one 13 year old picks up my book eventually in their school library and reads it and figures out they're not alone when they are in the bathroom thinking, I can't be this body it'll be worth it. That's how I feel about every every single story. That's how I go to the difficult places because I think of that person. I hope that was helpful. So the question almost is directed at writing for others. And I think that, um, Kelly, write for yourself first. Um, when I began writing, I had a lot of bad stories to tell and I just wanted to get them out. I started writing very short pieces. Um, they were flash and microfiction. And the short form is great because you can tell your story in, you know, 500 words or 300 words. Um, a couple of years ago, I started working with a writing instructor out of Annapolis. Her name is Lynn Ald Schwartz, and her website, I think, is the Writer's Word House. She has regular classes called um, Micro Memoir and Tiny Tales, and she does some of these at the Writer's Center in Maryland on Zoom. But what I learned from her is um, she teaches how to tell stories in just, you know, 300 words. And you don't have to tell your whole life story, but you can try, you know, writing just a moment, um, writing about a moment of change that you had. And that doesn't have to be a life altering moment, but just a small moment where something is different at the end than it was at the beginning. And once you write and write and write, um, I think you will feel more confident about um, things that are usable. Um, when I say the word usable, I think about um, getting it out for others. When is it appropriate for others to see? Um, I, I'm, I'm looking at your question. Um, you're wondering about working it in a literary direction. You know, just write. Um, and I think that these things will come. If you are looking at writing in a literary direction, you're not gonna be writing 
in another direction. Um, I think you will just start to do that. But definitely, as Rebecca said, look into some classes um, and just keep writing, keep a notebook, keep, you know, Google Docs on your phone and just write snippets. Um, and I hope that, you know, these are helpful for you. Um, and I think that Tara might also have a couple of suggestions. Yeah, um, I, I completely agree with the advice to, um, you know, to try starting small. I guess the um, be patient with yourself is another uh, piece I would I would hope you can you can do. Um, it's you may feel this like urgency to bring this stuff out to the page and you know and yes i mean that is that energy is so essential that passion that drive putting the words down that's all an essential part of the process so yes listen to that but be patient with yourself in terms of which direction it's going to go is this going to be a larger work uh, that, you know, uh, like a, a, a book length project or, or are you just going to work on a 300 word story for now? Um, each piece will come as it comes. It might not be prose. It might be poems. I am, um, as I was thinking about this panel, I wanted to talk about this book, Julia Mallory, Survivor's Guilt. Um, this was an incredibly difficult topic to write about. She wrote about the death of her son. Um, and she did it through poetry, prose, photographs, um, interspersed. She didn't rely on any one piece to carry the whole weight. So I think that also might be something to think about. Um, just like you shouldn't have to carry the whole weight of that experience and just hold it all in. No one piece is required to carry the whole weight of your life experience. So you can experiment and play with different ways of getting that out there and not have to worry that one is right or one is wrong because they're all part of you working through that experience. Let me see. I have another question in the chat here. I'll take one from our guests before I take uh, Chloe's if that's okay. Um, when writing about trauma, do you have a process for preparing yourself to get in the mindset to access it? Do you free write first before formulating a draft, for example, or read pieces that inspire you? Do either of you have feedback for that question? I do. So when I first began writing, um, writing seriously as an adult, as I mentioned in my my mid-ish 40s I was a lifestyle blogger before and I thought I really want to write about these two really traumatic things um I wrote about them both in second person because second person is you you did this you went to this place and so it really it allows us to separate it allows us to put the trauma and the experience on this mystical you. And when your parent, something, 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 it's not me, it is this you. So um, that was for me a really good way to begin just writing these really raw things. Um, I will not go back and read them um I started to read a paragraph of one I'm like I don't want to read this I'm not going back there um so as far as preparing yourself um with a free write everybody's writing process is different um I hate writing prompts I hate free writing so for me no but if a person likes to free write and likes to just free association on the page, then yes, that is their process and they should do it. Um, the writing process is not just when our fingers type on the keyboard. The writing process is walking the dog and thinking about it. It's jotting down stuff on a post-it note that you stuff into your coat pocket. It's, you know, bouncing ideas off people. It's coming to workshops. Um, so 
whatever it is that you find helpful. And it could be, you know, rewriting, reading things that inspire you. There are tons of things that you can do before you start writing your draft. Um, but I would try all of them because if you are going to write about trauma specifically, it might hurt. And you might get up from your laptop and feel terrible about it. Um, so go in small doses, but yes, try the free writing. Try thinking about it while you're knitting. Um, so that is my two cents. Uh, well, I have uh, one piece of advice I would give, and um, I've heard this from uh, a couple of writers, is I know this is counterintuitive to writing, but taking notes verbally. Um, I use the notes app. And when I'm out and I just want to say something that's difficult that I'm thinking about for my story, I just open the notes app and I try not to think at all about what it sounds like, what it's going to look like. And I say it into the, in, in, into the notes app and it's great. It comes out and it comes out in like very strange gerbils of stuff, right? And then I download, download it onto the page and I look at it. And even if I don't use... E one word of that entire thing, it's given me the permission to start editing or like putting that feeling on the page. Um, because a blank page is intimidating and you're, you're trying to tell, especially a difficult traumatic story or, or even, you know, a, a small, the first piece I ever published uh, two years ago was a, a, a one second interaction with a man one second, he said like three seconds of something to me and that changed my life in a way. You know, I was ashamed of what he said. And then years later, I was like, no, you know, uh, and it's it's about, it was about him not thinking uh, my name is, uh, belongs to me, Rebecca Morrison. Um, my mother, my parents named me Rebecca and my husband's last name is Morrison, uh, but I'm from Iran and he found it very offensive. Um, and he said just a couple of things to me, you know, just a, not even a whole sentence and, you know, two phrases and walked away. My point is, even if you're writing about a two minute interaction, it could have a lifetime of baggage before and a lifetime of baggage after. And putting all that on the page, if you, if you go into it with a blank screen thinking, how am I going to tell this enormous thing? It's very difficult, but if you just like, like uh, um, I think both of these guys said, if you put small bits, but mm -hmm. just like a, it's a hack, I would say the, the notes app, the notes app has been amazing. And I'll tell you something at the barrel house conference, the only writing conference I've gone to so far, but I plan to go to millions in the next, you know, 30, 40 years of my life. Uh, now that I've become a writer and I, I love it and it's the best thing in my life. Um, uh, hold on. I'm having a senior moment. Um, barrel house conference. Somebody said something about putting it on the page. I can't remember now, but, um, somebody take over Tara go. I will take over. Okay. Um, I think for me, um, having a specific conversation or image is where I can often kind of hang that hat of all of those years of crap, you know? Um, so that conversation Rebecca was talking about, or, you know, in my case, I had an Austrian boyfriend who, you know, asked me, Binish Dainega, uh, when I was, you know, teasing him about, you know, bringing my laundry up. And he says, he said to me, basically, am I your Negro? Um, and I was, well, A, shocked, but B, curious about how quickly that came out. And is that an actual expression that people use? And how did that expression come to be? And, you know, so I was, uh, it was like that image and then time, image plus time for me equals curiosity. And that's when I'm often able to sort of dig into something, um, something specific. It's not an ism, it's a specific um, phrase 
or a specific image. When I was driving back uh, from the coast with a friend, we saw in the middle of Alexandria, Virginia, that statue of the Confederate soldier. I'm like, hold up. <laughs> I literally had to stop the car and say, what the fuck is this? Because I'm from Alaska and that's as far north as you can get. What the fuck is this? You know? And so that was like an image of me stopping the car, getting out and crossing several lanes of traffic to stand there and like, is this what I think I'm seeing? So I think for me, like getting in that mind space means like having a specific launching point from which I can just kind of grow the story or the poem or whatever from, from there. Tara, um, I remembered yeah. what, um, yes, and please. it's related to um, the conference when I was with you guys. When I went to the conference last year, I just had really started to think about um, how am I going to write a, a, an entire novel um, when the only thing I've written is 1,200 words? Uh, you know, it's essays, essays that are 800, 1,200. And there was a great panel, a wonderful panel of these writers um, that had written memoirs and a, a poetry collection, I believe, last year. And one of the writers got up and uh, said, I wrote my entire memoir in the Notes app. And I, and her memoir is fantastic. I, her na first name is Nima. I can't remember her last name. Um, and it gave me permission. Give yourself permission to write in whatever way works for you. Say it into a notes app, throw it on a recorder, write notes on sticky pads, do with your, you know, long hand, short hand, you know, iPad. People think that I thought before I became a writer that every writer, if it's a real writer, will be sitting at their desk alone for seven months or two years and just clicking away. That's not how it works for most of us. We have to talk to somebody. We have to be in a writing group or not. We have to take classes and we do it in all kinds of ways. Give yourself permission to write your story in whatever way you want. You're still a writer as long as you get your story out. Thank you so much. I don't know if that's how, uh, I mean, it's, it's such a great sentiment. I don't know if we have to end exactly on the hour or if we have time for one more question, I'll let our hosts make that call. We can have one more question if you like. Okay. Um, and this may be a short one if we don't have answers. Uh, the question is, how do you identify a trauma sensitive editor? What would you ask of editors who shepherd trauma stories to publication? Um, and as a parenthetical, I'd like to see the publishing industry treat trauma storytellers with utmost compassion. Um, do either of you have specific answers for that? Um, I don't actually, I, I have an editor that I love and it's funny, I never considered, I mean, I've sent her all kinds of stuff and I never considered once, like, because I, I knew how, I knew that she was good to work with. I just didn't think that I would need a special kind of editor. Um, but now that, you know, we have trigger warnings and stuff. Um, so I'm sorry, but I just, it never occurred to me to figure that out. And I just got, I guess, got lucky. Sometimes you find the people that fit fit with your writing. Um, they seek you out or you seek them out. Again, I would say the best way to do this um, for me anyway, if I had to decide is to go to places that there are writers and editors, um, uh, webinars. There are a lot of free webinars that are incredibly informative with agents and editors and publishers and writers. Um, Susan Shapiro does a bunch of free ones. Allison Williams does a bunch of free ones and she brings in editors and, uh, writers all the time. Um, and then of course there's paid ones, but that's where I would see someone who's published similar type work and reach out to them, message them on Twitter or Instagram. I've been surprised uh, being a new writer. I've reached out to very successful or not successful or obscure anyone that I find interesting, any writer. I will email them or message them something very simple and authentic and 
every single one of them has been so kind because I've just come from a place of curiosity and, and honesty. So put, be out there and connect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, the first thing that came to mind is, um, you know, perhaps uh, similar advice to when uh, people ask how to find an agent um, and kind of what you were alluding to, Rebecca, if you see pieces that you feel were really had a deft touch, um, uh, uh, there's nothing wrong with uh, approaching that author and saying how much you really appreciated their work and, you know, ask their advice, you know, did, would you recommend or did you work with an editor specifically about this? Um, and, uh, you know, I think as writers, we're always happy to talk about uh, our craft and to, um, you know, help anyone else uh, along the line in any way we can. So definitely looking at models that you feel were effective and, and really sensitively done um, is a great place to start. So, um, well, I think uh, that is a great uh, piece of specific, hard-hitting advice that we can end our panel with. So thank you all for your questions and um, I'll hand it back over to our hosts. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you guys. This has really been wonderful. I feel like I've learned so much. I feel a little braver than I did earlier today. Um, I really, we really appreciate your coming here to Brown Bag Lit. If um, those of you who came to attend this or other online free events that we've offered, please consider making a small donation to help cover our administrative costs at Buy Me a Coffee, where you registered. And please do, I encourage, if you're thinking about buying the books, to buy them from Annie Bloom's bookstore. They've kindly set up a bookshelf just for our fake AWP events. And we really hope to see you at future events, future classes. Thank you for coming.